big up the world. Okay, so uh, we have Andrew Bowser here, which I'm uh, sure you probably all remember from the, uh, from the screen there. It's hard to miss. And uh, Andrew, why don't you introduce, I know we have Ian Woods at the, the end there, but... Yes, yeah, so we have Ian and J.D. Woods, and they were producers on the film, but on a film this small, they were also everything else that has to happen to make a movie happen. So yeah, they wore 10 hats each to make the movie. Yeah, so let's open it up to... Uh, to the audience first, I'm sure there's probably a lot of questions, and if you guys don't have questions, I have a lot of questions that <laughs> I'd like to ask, because each time I see this, I'm kind of like, how do we do that? So, yeah, right in the back there. Yeah, I, based on just how, let's just say it, ballsy this uh, concept was, uh, would you ever try something like this again, and why or why not? <laughs> Uh, I would try something like this again, because I think if anything, it just gave me for a, a taste for how exciting it was. I mean, the reason we did it was because we thought, you know, it would be a challenge, and it would be something, uh, I guess, kind of like a white whale to chase. And doing it this one time really did just kind of give me a taste to want to do it again. And because uh, we figured so much out about what worked and what didn't work, and how you could really attack this on a bigger scale. And I had all sorts of ideas while we were executing it that could have taken it to a bigger scale. We just didn't have the time and money to pull that off. So yeah, I would definitely do something like this again, for sure. Yeah, right in the middle. Uh, what were you most worried about in the process of filming this? Uh, I, <laughs> I was most worried about jumping off the bridge and getting impaled by something. <laughs> because the, uh, the chief of police in the town told us ahead of time that people dumped trash off the bridge. And so, you know, on and one side of the bridge, in there and stuff. Yeah, too. yeah. <laughs> you can see box springs and like an old Ford truck. And, and so he told us, like, you might want to swim out there ahead of time and make sure there's nothing sharp sticking up. So uh, I honestly was most concerned about that. Which we is probably we a good would thing. check every day to yeah. make sure, like, every time we went out. <laughs> and you'd be like, we've got to have somebody swim out there just to yeah. make sure. I mean, like, we just did it yesterday. But, you know, it makes sense. I just have these weird fantasies that someone in the middle of the night just, like, you know, threw away a bunch of barbed wire. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like, that bridge jump was like a divining rod for all my fears. I only thought about the bridge jump. Everything else was kind of secondary to that. I was most worried about the locals because we could be doing our whole thing, we could be halfway through, and someone could be walking, hey, what are y'all doing? You know, uh, shooting a film? And there was, you see some bikers before he walks into the bar in the background. I had to sprint down before they got to that location and say, we're shooting a movie, uh, just don't look at the camera. If, if, if This is really important. They're coming here, don't look at it, don't bother them, and then like sprint back, and then I see them coming around the corner, I was like, da 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 da, -da. <laughs> extra, we pulled up. <laughs> we pulled up and I looked outside and saw JD and all these bikers, so like, why can't we get a drink? And so angry. <laughs> it, was, it, was late, it was Labor Day that day as well, so it was just a group of bikers looking for a bar that was open on Labor Day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right there in the gray. Uh, I'll be honest, it was not one take, oh. it was two. Uh, it was an hour long take and 30 minutes. disappointed now. I know. Uh, <laughs> you didn't think the movie sucked before, you do now. Uh, it, it was intended to be one take and that was definitely what we wanted to do, uh, but we just couldn't do it for two reasons. The camera kept overheating. It, or, it overheated about 30 or 40 minutes in on the Sunday, bef uh, the Sunday before Labor Day. And, uh, and so we were like, well, we're done. We didn't do it. We didn't get the movie that we came here to get. But all the actors kind of rallied together and said, well, we can shoot on Labor Day. Can you get all the locations on Labor Day? And we couldn't. The bar that Worm is, is tortured in at the end of the film, the, uh, the guy that was in charge of the bar was like, you can't be in here past noon tomorrow. I'm over it. I'm over the movie. A lot of people didn't quite get the idea that like, you just need to stay open because we could come through at any point in time, depending on where we are in rehearsal. So we had to get to that bar before noon. So the only way to guarantee that would be to take the second half first on that day. So we, we ran the second half first, uh, up to the, uh, starting at the bridge jump, and then the first act second, yeah. up until the bridge jump, and then we edit on the water. Which is kind of like, uh, I thought about like not you know revealing that, but I don't know, I'm always annoyed when a movie says it's one take and it's not. I'd rather just be honest about the uh, trials that we face trying to pull it off. 
And those are the two things, the camera overheating and the guy at the blowout club being a dick. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's funny, Andrew, you mentioned that because when I found out that it was two takes, I was trying to figure out, I was like, where is there? I bet it's in the water. It's got to be in the water. So, okay. That's good, because if it wasn't in the water, I was going to have wonder really where that, uh, where that cut was. So, uh, yeah, right in the middle. Uh, great beard, was that real? And I'm, I'm also really curious who the music was. Excellent soundtrack. Thank you. Uh, the beard was 100% CGI. It was actually the majority of the budget went to the beard. Now my wife would attest to the fact that the beard was real. Uh, the beard was real. I started growing it out during hockey playoffs last year. When my team, the Capitals, were killed, but the LA Kings stayed in. So I kept growing the beard, and then it grew into the worm beard. It's like six or seven months. And the music is a guy named Aaron Marsh, who used to be in a band called Copeland. And I, I used to direct music videos, and I did some music videos for Copeland. So he uh, was the uh, composer for the original music, yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah. Is this the first full-length movie that uh, you guys have made, or do you have other movies that you've directed and directed? Well, I had done two other small independent films. One was called The Mother of Invention, and then one was called Jimmy Tupper versus the Goat Man of Bowie. And Jimmy Tupper is kind of similar to this in that it's an experimental feature that kind of plays with narrative. Um, but, but I got linked up with the Woods Bros because of the Mother of Invention. And this is the first feature we've collaborated on, but they've worked on other projects. Yeah, I, I, liked, I found out about Andrew through Mother of Invention and some other sketches online a couple of years ago now. Um, and just, I, you know, was living in LA at the time, or am still now, but like, I just messaged him and was like, hey, I got a DSLR package uh, and some lights if you want to shoot some sketches. And uh, we just started shooting, you know, small sketches together and it just grew into friendship. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I got an idea. Let's do a one take GoPro. Gosh. And then I, yeah, I dropped the mic and left. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's called a Snoricam. It wasn't quite, well, it kind of shoulder. It was, it was actually built by a friend of mine on the East Coast where I'm originally from, DC, Baltimore area. Um, and it was, a uh, Baby Bjorn was what was attaching it to me. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then like a, a custom made wooden frame that led away from me about maybe a little over a foot. Um, and so the, we, we, we duct taped it to my body because the time when we tested the bridge jump, the GoPro kept moving the little elbow on the uh, underwater. Mouth. So we had to we epoxied yeah. the GoPro like into its mouth, like that thing wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was a, the Snoricam is I guess the technical term for what it was. Yeah. Yeah. We, well, the, oh, yeah, yeah, I was going to say, well, we, we knew we had to shoot on the GoPro, and yeah. if people know about the GoPro, there's a new version of the camera out called the Hero 3 that can shoot at 24 frames per second. It comes with a firmware that allows you to shoot footage that looks more like a film, but when we filmed our movie, uh, that firmware didn't exist, at least for the public. So most of our time in Oklahoma, not most of it, but leading up to shooting was like emailing GoPro and saying, we're about to make a movie on your camera. Could we get that firmware? Because we had heard about it. You'd already heard about like protein update and stuff. So we just yeah. tried our hardest to get it and ended up finding a way in. And yeah, the way we got that firmware on the Hero 2 to shoot at 24 frames per second and to have like a higher bit rate and a kind of more neutral color palette was that I, I shoot weddings. That's my day job. And I shot a wedding for a man that works at Team Downey, and that's why Team Downey is thanked in the credits, because while we were in Oklahoma, I emailed this guy, and I was like, I know this is unprofessional, but I'm making a movie on a GoPro, blah, blah, blah. We really want this firmware. Could you get it for us? Because you could throw around Team Downey's name. And this guy got it. He got it for us, and we got the zip folder and downloaded it. So that's why Probably I did. like five days before we shot it. Yeah, like five days before we shot it, we were out doing bridge tests, and I got the email. Like, oh, we got the firmware. So, so that's why we could shoot at 24, and the colorist was able to play more with the uh, the black and white and the, the range, the latitude of it all, and the visual effects dudes were able to take out shadow removal and things like that yeah. on that footage, yeah. In the far back right there. I actually have two questions. One, how often when you were setting up practice runs of this, did you actually run the camera into something? 
Um, uh, a bunch. Every time I got into a car, out of a car, it hit the side of the car. And there's, <laughs> you could do a blooper reel of me just hitting the side of cars and going, God damn it, every single time. And Ian knows the hardest thing was actually, uh, other than getting in and out of cars, was starting the ATV in the beginning of the film. I was the only start. person on the crew who knew how to drive a four-wheeler, <laughs> and he could not get the thing started. And it's at the beginning of the film, so you can't just start out the film with a guy, you know, starting a four-wheeler 800 times. Um, so there's, there's like me sitting, you know, just like a little, a couple blocks away in a Dodge Caliber, like waiting and just like not seeing him pass by in the four-wheeler, being like, All right, why hasn't he, why hasn't it started yet? Why hasn't it started yet? And then we draw, we get a call from one of the actors who's in that scene as well, and you know, have to go over there and, you know, he's not in the best of moods when that happens. And so, <laughs> and so I had to start up the ATV every time. Because what would take, if we took too long in the woods in the beginnings, just starting the movie and starting the ATV and shoveling and getting out of there, that was what added to the camera overheating quicker because we were standing out in the 107 degree weather in Oklahoma. And so, yeah, it was just a doubly like being mad at the ATV and my own incompetency. And then coupled with that was the longer I spend in the woods, the kind of the clock just was ticking further and further down for that camera to overheat. Um, yeah. But yeah, getting in and out of cars was the biggest thing and, and hitting the camera on door frames, yeah, that was a huge concern. My second question was how did you come up with the idea of naming your main character Worm? Well, that's interesting because almost all the names of characters in this film are based on my cousins in Arkansas. <laughs> and, uh, and I have an uncle named Maverick, I have an uncle uh, uh, named, uh, well I have a cousin named T.A. and he's got a friend named Worm. And I met them when I was 17, uh, we're the friend Worm I met when I was 17 visiting Arkansas. And I never knew why Worm, the real Worm was named Worm. I just knew that he had a scar that went all the way up the side of his face and everyone said it was because uh, a gun had misfired and shot him in the mouth and he was waiting on his big check from the class action lawsuit. And uh, I don't know if Worm ever got that check, but I love the idea of a guy being nicknamed Worm. And my mother, who lives in Arkansas, told me, well, I can find out why he's nicknamed Worm if you want to know for your movie. But I said I'd rather not know once I realized that my character would be named Worm for a very specific reason. And I didn't want to get kind of, you know, confused. Because maybe the real Worm was nicknamed Worm because of his pencil dick. And if that was the case, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to take my movie seriously. <laughs> so, that was based on the real dude. Yeah? I noticed in the, in the credits for the film that most of the dialogue in the videos looped later. You had different people doing the voices than who played them on the screen. Did the people appearing on the screen know that their voices weren't going to be used in the film? I don't think so. I, well, everybody knew that it was going to be a, a really hard project to complete and everybody got the concept that everyone was mostly appearing off camera but no i didn't ever intend on replacing people's performances it wasn't until i got back to la when i realized certain performances needed to be replaced and a lot of it was it's just because the nature of the project it was always kind of amorphous and certain scenes would grow and shrink and I watched what we had and realized, you know, what would help that is to fill that out with a few more lines of dialogue. But, you know, I was in LA. But JD was in charge of getting the actors who I was going to continue to use, getting them to do more audio in Oklahoma. Go well, on. Andrew actually drove all the way back to Oklahoma to get additional audio. He stayed how many days in Guthrie? Several days in Guthrie. He would go out in the middle of the night. Yeah, and do footsteps, yeah. footsteps closed close doors, um, and would get audio from the actors. And we thought that that would be enough. And then he was like, oh, I need some more from you know these couple actors. And he'd send me uh, his Zoom recorder, and I'd round up the actors, record them, hoping that everything would work out. And you know, just the nature of the project didn't. Um, and it was just easier for them to be in the studio, have other people in the studio in LA, and be able to match it up. And yeah, yeah. The hardest thing was replacing people that whose mouths were actually seen on camera. And that was when it came down to, well, I should get those performances in LA. The only the only terrible part about it is that I was friends with some of the people that got their voices replaced. So it was, you know, like. You know, Facebook status is like paging Mr. Herman, Mr. Herman, like, you know, 
just like a little making jokes about ADR. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was a little awkward, but it's okay. And my voice was replaced by Tom Selleck. I don't know if anybody. Yeah. Yeah. That. <laughs> it's a long and distinguished list of people who've had their uh, voices replaced. That's true. Andy McDonald. Uh, yeah, right there. So what came to you first, the story or the idea to film a movie with the GoPro? Um, the, the first idea was to, to film a movie with a Sonora cam, or from that perspective, yeah. And then, then it kind of naturally led to the GoPro. But originally, Ian's pretty much responsible for, well, Ian and JD combined are responsible for it becoming Worm, a film set in Oklahoma, uh, about these kind of southern, like, gothic neo-noir characters. Because I had an idea to do this, and I was going to do it in LA, and it was going to be about a, a guy kind of getting involved with a girl at his work, like maybe he worked at Staples, because I live across the street from straight, uh, Staples. But then it turns out, you know, she date her brothers in an East LA gang, and my like gringo character does something for the gang, and then gets pinned for something. Like it was really going to be like a Run Lola Run type of scenario. And then when I mapped it out, I realized, well, that would be impossible in Los Angeles because every time you know, have a gun out, I mean, <laughs> well, that's, that's, yeah, it's like it'd be yeah. impossible in LA. Like yeah. people could have gotten shot before in LA because Just they're for filming, filming a movie, right? Yeah. And so I was explaining it to Ian and JD, and they were like, "Well, this would be much easier to pull off in Oklahoma, where we're from." And so once I once they said that, I realized, well, hang on.